thank you. Um, all right, so uh, today I'm sure you'll be all surprised to know that I'm going to be interested in uh, closed hyperbolic three manifolds. And as I outlined um, yesterday, the study of hyperbolic three manifolds plays a central role in the study of three dimensional topology. Um, and what I'm going to be interested in today is norms on the first cohomology of this hyperbolic manifold, or of course equivalently its second homology. Uh, and these two norms, they, they measure the complexity of representatives of the cohomology class, uh, but from two very different perspectives. So the first perspective is purely topological. This is something called the Thurston norm. So I'm going to spend the first third of my talk defining these two norms carefully, but just as an outline, let me say something. Um, the Thurston norm, at least let's say if I have an integral cohomology class, I really want to think of as a, its dual homology class, um, what the Thurston norm does is it sort of measures the complexity of the simplest surface, records maybe it's better to say than measures, and it records the simplest uh, representative of the dual homology class. This norm was introduced by Thurston in the 1970s, but I mean questions go uh, this form go back to the very beginning of geometric topology. Uh, you know, you have a knot and a three sphere. You ask what's the uh, least genus of a ciphered surface that it bounds. It's that kind of, of thing. Um, so that's the purely topological side of the story I wish to tell you. Um, and the geometric side. Instead, I'll think of the cohomology as coming from um, Duram's complex. So we'll actually represent things by smooth one forms. Um, and in that case, there is a, actually an inner product on one forms, which leads to a notion of what's called a harmonic one form. I'll explain a lot more about this in a minute. Uh, but in any event, uh, these harmonic forms, they're sort of unique, nice representatives of cohomology classes, nice with respect to the Ramanian metric on M. So this is going to be something which involves, uh, at the base level, the geometry of this manifold, as opposed to purely its topology. Um, and anyway, you take these sort of preferred representatives and you measure their size with respect to the inner product that I mumbled about a second ago. <laughs> so this is L2 norm of harmonic representatives. And so the question I want to address today is how do these two norms relate? I have two motivations for doing this. Uh, the first is that, as I explained yesterday, uh, when you have uh, a hyperbolic three manifold, Mostow rigidity tells you that the hyperbolic metric is completely determined by the underlying topology. In fact, just by the underlying fundamental group. Uh, so um, while this, I call this the geometric norm, because it will involve uh, the Ramanian metric, uh, in fact, it's in some sense just as topological as the Thurston norm. Uh, and so it's, as I think I alluded to last time, while the geometry is determined by the topology, we don't have a complete uh, understanding of sort of the linkage. So uh, in this case, the Thurston norm and the harmonic norm, they, they're similar kinds of objects, but what I'd like to tell you today is what's the relationship between them? That's not, not something that's obvious. Um, and that's sort of a general motivation, this sort of, I don't know, maybe call it effective Mostow rigidity or quantitative Mostow rigidity. Uh, the more immediate motivation for the work I'm going to tell you about today uh, is uh, the story about torsion growth 
that I talked about last time. Um, so towards the end of this talk, I'll connect it back to what I said yesterday. In particular, though, there, if you remember that plot, there were all these red dots that were much lower than maybe they should be. The um, reason for that has to do with these, these two norms. Uh, other questions so far? OK, so let me start um, by defining these two norms. Let me maybe start with the harmonic norm. Certainly, that's the one that's uh, less familiar to me as a topologist. So, OK, so we just, if we take some one forms on um, our three manifold, uh, there's an inner product. Uh, that's used in the proof of the Hodge theorem, where you prove that you know, Durham cohomology is the same as ordinary cohomology, uh, which is this. So you say the inner product of one forms alpha and beta is going to be defined by integrating some, I guess it has to be a three form over M. Uh, and the way you get a three form from this is you take the uh, wedge product of alpha with the Hodge star of beta. So the Hodge star of beta is a two form. Um, and uh, the definition of the Hodge star, I mean, it sort of intimately involves the metric. The notion of what's an orthonormal basis tells you how to take um, you know, dx to dy wedge dz or something like this. All right, so this turns out to be a positive definite symmetric uh, bilinear form on um, the set of, of one forms. And um, we'll mostly be interested in the associated norm, which I'll denote like this. So, of course, that's just the square root of the inner product of the vector with itself. Um, here's the way I like to think about this. this I, I admit I don't have much intuition for that sort of formulation, formulation there. Um, if we think about, maybe I'll write it over here, right? If I have a one form, that means at every point, I have a covector, that is to say, a linear map from the tangent space um, at that point to the real numbers. Uh, and so I can think of this as just it's a linear operator. So I can think about the operator norm of the one form at this point. What's the most that it stretches a unit length vector? Um, and so. This L2 norm is just the L2 norm of this function. This is a function, right? a function from M to R. And so we just take the L2 norm of that. So we integrate the square of that function with respect to the volume. Uh, and then I had better take a square root. So it's just sort of, I mean, Another way of thinking about it is that you know, having an inner product allows you to identify one forms um, with ve vector fields. And in that case, this is just really like the length of the vector at this point. So you can imagine this as you have like a vector field on your three manifold. And you're just looking at the lengths of these vectors as a function. And you're taking the L2 norm of that function. So that's the this norm. Now that's a function on forms. It's not a function on cohomology. Uh, different representatives of the same cohomology class will have different L2 norms. Um, but it turns out that there is, in any given cohomology class, uh, a, unique representative, a unique representative which minimizes this quantity. So that's what's called the harmonic representative. So for any first cohomology class, there is a unique representative alpha uh, which minimizes this L2 norm. Um, and this is called the uh, 
harmonic representative and um, another way to think about it is that it's in the kernel of a certain elliptic differential operator namely the uh, Laplacian operator on one forms. So the kernel of lambda 1, so d composed with d star plus d star composed with d acting on one forms. Um, so it's some kind of nice, nice kind of thing. It solved some partial differential equation. All right, so this is sort of from the point of view of this inner product, this uh, harmonic representative is the best representative uh, of this cohomology class. And so that I'm just going to define the harmonic norm of the cohomology class phi to be uh, the L2 norm of its harmonic representative. Um, and uh, the fact that this is a norm comes from the fact that uh, from the second definition you can see that if you have two harmonic forms and add them together, so this is a, a linear kind of thing, you'll still get another harmonic form. So in fact you can actually identify, and this is how you prove the Hodge theorem, this is how you show that Durham cohomology is the same as ordinary cohomology, um, you identify the uh, first cohomology with the subspace of harmonic forms. Um, so in particular, really, we're just taking the restriction of this inner product to the finite dimensional subspace of harmonic forms and saying, hey, uh, we have a norm. Are there questions so far? Is this kind of a quotient here? What is a quotient? Um, no, it's, it minimizes this, this norm. So what is, I have some pictures that I think maybe will clarify this. Uh, so this part of the talk is a joint work with Anil Harani, a computer scientist, uh, a numerical analyst. Um, please don't do that again. <laughs> Uh, so I just want to actually show, none of the discussion, I mean I shouldn't have just covered it up, but none of the discussion I made had any reference to the fact that this is a hyperbolic manifold or that the dimension was, um, dimension was three. This inner product makes perfect sense in any dimension. And since I have difficulty drawing hyperbolic three manifolds, well actually it's not my real reason. The real reason we haven't written the code yet. Um, I'm going to show you pictures of this norm um, and harmonic forms on a hyperbolic surface. So in particular, uh, just to keep it as small as possible, I'm not actually going to do, say, a genus 2 surface, but I'll look at a hyperbolic metric on a torus with one cone point of order pi. So that properly speaking, this is an orbifold. Um, it's obtained, so here's my copy of the Poincaré model of the hyperbolic plane. So it's obtained from this. Um, quadrilateral here by identifying, as usual to make the torus, the left side with the right and the bottom with the top. So that folds that up as, as usual into, into the torus. And then these points here, if you calculated their angles, I mean, you can eyeball it, right? It is a, more, they are what they seem. Uh, the angles here in the four corners add up to pi. And then, OK, we can look in my cartoon here um, at these two curves, here's one curve, I'll call it A, and another curve, I'll call it B. So those generate the integral first homology. Um, I'm just going to use those to define a basis for the first cohomology. Uh, and well, since we have this hyperbolic metric, I'd really like to work with the geodesic representatives of A and B, uh, and that's what's drawn here. Right? So in the Poincaré model, um, I set it up exactly so that these two things go through the origin 
Um, and so GEDs, generally speaking in this picture, look like circles meeting the boundary at right angles, but uh, that should include straight lines going directly through the origin. So these are two geodesics, and this side is glued to this side exactly so that this continues straight if you go like that. So our question is just about this, this surface. OK, so uh, let's, here are some, um, here's a picture of a harmonic one form. Well, OK, so um, of course, I don't know how to visualize a, a, yes. Oh, I don't know how to visualize a, a form, so let me visualize the dual vector field. OK, so in other words, um, if I had a vector like this and asked you what is the uh, form alpha due to this vector, you would just take its inner product with the vector that you see. All right. um, and so the particular cohomology class that we looked at here, it's the Poincaré dual of um, the uh, red curve here, A. So in other words, it's the thing that counts how many times. So if I have some loop on my torus, then integrating alpha along that loop is the same as counting the number of intersections with this red curve. So if the blue curve, which I don't have drawn here, but you know, runs through like this, if we integrate the length, well, sorry, not integrate the length. If we integrate this uh, vector field along that curve, we would, get, we would get one. So why does the harmonic representative look like this? Um, well, I mean, if you think about the, the proof of Poincaré duality, right? this is not the vector field you write down. You would take a small neighborhood of uh, the submanifold of this red thing. And you would take a form that's just concentrated completely in that small neighborhood. Something so when you just, just have to have the property, when you have an arc that goes across it, uh, integrating the vector field gives you, gives you one. Um, but that's not efficient from the point of view of this L2 norm. So to sort of simplify, but really not much. The, the condition that we're in this particular cohomology class is it's an L1 condition. It says you know, if you integrate around a certain loop, you have to get a certain number. So you should think about that as just saying, well, suppose I have a function on the unit interval, and I want that the integral of this function is 1. Well, there's lots of ways we could do that. We could just take a function whose height is 1. I think this picture shows very much I'm not a geometer. Um, or this is my excuse, I should say, for drawing it this way. Uh, of course, well, we could also take a function uh, you know, whose height is a lot more than 1. I'm going to go with this as a fifth. All right, so then this thing has height 5. All right, those functions both satisfy the same condition. So in my picture, they're analog. They both represent the same cohomology class. But in terms of the L2 norm, uh, the L2 norm of this thing is 1. Um, and the L2 norm of this is what? Square root of 5, isn't it? Uh, square root of 5. Right, so you take 5, you square it, get 25, integrate it over this, get 5, take the square root. Yes. So it's way worse. Okay. So if your goal is to have a fixed integral and to minimize the L2 norm, you want to spread out as much as possible. Okay. And that's why, in this picture, these arrows are all roughly the same length. And anyway, so that's uh, the harmonic representative. It's all sort of kind of relaxed. Uh, and um, then if you actually look at the L2 norm, integrate the length of this, it turns out its, it's L2 norm is 1.37. Just a number. Other questions? All right, here's our other basis element for the first cohomology. Uh, this is the Poincaré dual to. Uh, 
the blue loop beta. Um, so again, it, uh, the form has spread out. The vectors here are a lot shorter than the preceding thing. And that's because right, you have to integrate to 1 as you go around. And so this distance here being much more than the distance here, the vectors get to be shorter and have the same, and have the same integral. Um, and actually, you might notice that the other picture, the vectors were all almost the same length. Um, here, they do drop off more as you get farther away from the blue curve. And that's because there's some tension in this picture between the desire to spread out and one of kind of the key properties of hyperbolic space. Um, and that key property is, you know, in Euclidean space, right, if you look at a circle of uh, radius r, right, the circumference is just constant times r. But in hyperbolic space, you look at a circle of radius r, its uh, circumference is exponential in r. Things spread out a lot. So and there's, of course, some distortion here because of the Poincaré model. And consequently, there's actually a lot of area out here. So if you imagine a representative of this where these guys got a little shorter at the consequence of these guys getting a little bigger, that turns out to be less efficient than the picture here uh, because there's sort of more area out here than in here. Right, so they, it's not like they're going to be absolutely the same length everywhere. Um, it sort of depends on the geometry. So here's just a picture where I have um, both of these two vector fields. Uh, the original one, alpha, is in red and, and the other one is in blue. Um, as I mentioned, this norm actually comes from an inner product. So we could take the inner product of these guys. It's a small positive number because you can see these guys form an angle that's just a little less than 90 degrees most of the time. Um, and so then this over here is a, a picture of uh, the first cohomology of this surface. Um, and then it has this norm. So I just drew the unit ball in this norm, the set of points with norm um, less than 1. And well, alpha had bigger norm than beta, so this point is closer in than this point. Um, and since it comes from an inner product, I mean, this, inner, this, uh, this ball is just an ellipse. Um, and it's sort of tilted this way because this is a, a positive, positive point. So that's what the harmonic norm looks like for this surface. Are there questions? OK, so that's the first norm. Um, the second norm, which do not worry, will not take me another 20 minutes to describe, uh, is the Thurston norm. Um, and the situation here is, OK, let's start initially with an integral class. Uh, so the definition is we look at all representatives of the Poincaré dual so S is just some nice embedded surface in my manifold Poincaré dual to phi um, and I want it to have a no S2 components uh, any in a hyperbolic manifold, any, any embedded S2 bounds a ball. So homologically, it's not interesting. We, we don't want any of those messing with our heads. Um, and then what we look at, we want to basically just take the simplest surface that's Poincaré dual to this. Um, and so we measure that by the Euler characteristic. But let's make it uh, minus the Euler characteristic. So what I'm saying is we take the minimum of minus the Euler characteristic of S, where S is dual, dual to this. So this looks a lot like the um, stable commutator length that appeared in, in Joel's first talk at, at the workshop. So um, this is a, a function uh, on the first cohomology it takes integer values. Uh, and relatively simple cut and paste arguments show that this function is uh, subadditive um, and it's linear on rays. Um, and so none of that, I should say, uses that this is a hyperbolic manifold. This, this makes sense for any 
any uh, closed three manifold. Um, one thing that is special about, uh, so maybe I should first write what I just said. So it's sub additive. Uh, for a general manifold, there can be non zero classes which have Thurston norm zero. Um, for example, if I have something which is represented by a torus, and then the Thurston norm of that class is zero. So, for example, in the three torus, this is the function that takes everything to zero. But on a hyperbolic manifold, there are no interesting tori, um, homologically speaking. Any uh, torus bounds um, something. So, uh, For hyperbolic three manifolds, uh, this is non-degenerate. Every non-trivial class has non-trivial norm, uh, this, so this is a proper norm. Now, I guess so far it's still only defined on the integral classes, um, but it turns out I'm not going to explain exactly why, although it's not hard. Uh, you can actually extend this to the real cohomology just by continuity. I mean, first you extend it to the rationals because it's linear on rays, and then from there you have it defined on a dense set. So. And moreover, the unit ball in this norm is uh, just a so it's just a finite polytope. So it's just a you know, compact polytope with finite many vertices. And so, I mean, as I said, this, this definition was introduced by Thurston, but ideas like this have been considered for 100 years. Other questions? OK, so maybe just to summarize the story so far, right, we had a hyperbolic three manifold. We've been talking about its cohomology. Uh, and maybe just so I can draw the picture, let's say the cohomology is two dimensional. Um, and we had these two norms. So on the one hand, we have the Thurston norm. And the unit ball in the Thurston norm, in this case, is just a finite polygon. So that's the set of points where the Thurston norm is less than 1. Um, and then we also have the harmonic norm, uh, which comes from an inner product. So its unit ball, as we saw in the example, uh, is an ellipse, or ellipsoid in general. So I'll just be polite and pretend that's an ellipse. And so the question that I start out with is uh, how do these two uh, norm balls compare? Um, you know, can you scale one to lie in the other or conversely? And of course, in any fixed example, you can always do that. You could always shrink this norm a little. They both, both generate the same topology on this vector space. Uh, but uh, the result I want to tell you about, which is joint work with Jeff Brock, um, is that the way these two norms relate is determined um, by just some basic properties of uh, the geometry of M. So, So if we have a hyperbolic manifold, uh, then on the first cohomology, one has the following relationship. So the, write it this way, so the harmonic norm um, is bounded below by 
a multiple of the Thurston norm. And that multiple constant can be taken to be pi divided by the square root of the volume of the manifold. Um, and it's similarly divide, bounded above by uh, some multiple of the Thurston norm. Uh, where now the multiple depends not on the volume, but on the injectivity radius. So remember from last time, uh, the injectivity radius is the smallest scale uh, in this manifold in which you can see any topology. So that's our uh, main result that I want to tell you about today. Um, and this was motivated, I mean, I'll explain at least partially the connection to what I said last time. Um, so really, I mean, both the Thurston norm and the harmonic norm, these are not recent things. Uh, but the first people to consider this in the context of hyperbolic manifolds were uh, Bergeron, uh, Singen, uh, and Venkatesh in a recent paper uh, about torsion growth. Um, and uh, also, there's related work, not in the concept of hyperbolic manifolds, but uh, for general Ramani manifolds and of uh, Kronheimer and Marufka from the perspective of gauge theory uh, from about uh, 20 years ago. So let me not say exactly uh, what, for example, these guys proved. I and mean, it was a similar statement. But uh, for example, this was not the square root of the volume, but the volume, which makes this number much smaller. Uh, the constants were not explicit. Uh, they were just implicit. Um, so that's, that's the main result. So these two, uh, these two norms, they're not exactly the same. And I think, I hope by the end, it'll be clear why they could never be exactly the same. Um, but uh, their differences are controlled by these, these geometric things. Are there questions on the statement? Are those constants optimal? Uh, the question is, are those constants optimal? So uh, definitely not. Um, the form of this inequality is optimal. In the sense, you can produce a sequence of manifolds where, say, the ratio of this norm to this norm grows uh, like the square root of the volume. Um, this bound is uh, probably not optimal. We do have examples that show that these constants have to go to infinity as the injectivity radius goes to 0. But they don't, our examples, these constants don't go to infinity as fast as this. Um, and so that's, that's one thing I, I would like to refine, but I don't really have any ideas. So let me now um, try to connect this back to what I was talking about yesterday. Other than the fact there's hyperbolic manifolds and sometimes number theorists' names appear, maybe not so much. In common, so this is kind of the little piece of the theoretical motivation for the torsion growth stuff that I neglected to mention. Um, it's the Ray Singer torsion. So this is a number that you associate to a Ramanian manifold. Of, of any dimension. Um, so it's a number. It has to do with the spectra of the uh, Laplace operator on differential forms of varying degrees. So maybe I'll just write it out. Uh, let's see. So I should sum uh, k equals 0 up to the dimension of m. There's a sine factor 
And you're not going to probably notice if I get it wrong, but uh, there's also a normalization factor that I always forget. All right, there's a constant k here. Don't worry about it. Um, and then, right, the, the, this part where you take the log of the determinant of lambda k, uh, where this is lambda k here. This is the uh, no, sorry. This is the same k. It's not a constant. It's just the it's the variable we're summing over. Hmm. Yeah, so that's right. I could really just start at 1. That's, that's true. Yep. Good. The audience is awake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I haven't told you that yet. So this is the Laplacian on k forms. Um, and the determinant prime is, well, if this is a finite dimensional space, which of course it's not, then determinant prime is just the product of the non-zero eigenvalues, right? Because the, this thing in our situation typically has kernel, right? The kernel of this is the harmonic forms that represents the cohomology. So if we just took sort of the determinant of this, we would get zero if we had any cohomology. Um, so you just take the non-zero eigenvalues. Now this thing, of course, is infinite dimensional. There's infinitely many eigenvectors. So you write down some zeta function and analytically continue it and blah, blah, blah. I don't really understand that definition. But don't worry, there's another one. Although this is really a theorem. This is called the cheater muller theorem. Uh, which says that in, this is sort of a dimension dependent thing. But in three dimensions, There's another way to interpret, well, there's a sort of more concrete way to write um, this torsion, which involves, as its first term, the thing I was talking about last time. That is, you look at the torsion in the first homology of the manifold and take the log. Um, and then there's a second term, which involves the volume of the manifold. log of the volume. And then there's another term, uh, which is, um, what I want to call it. Well, okay. log of the regulator of the first cohomology uh, with respect uh, to the harmonic norm. If it doesn't have any torsion, oh, um, that's OK. Log of 1 is 0, right? It's a torsion subgroup. So if there's no torsion, this is the size of the torsion subgroup. There's always the identity element, right? So that this is never 0. It's most 1, yeah. Good luck question. Um, so what's this regulator thing here? Well. Uh, Right, we have inside uh, our real cohomology the integral lattice of the integral cohomology. Um, and so uh, we could talk about like the quotient of the real cohomology by the integral cohomology. That's just some torus. Uh, and if we have this harmonic norm, it comes from an inner product, we have a volume form on this, uh, this cohomology which is certainly invariant under um, you know, addition of cohomology. Um, so we get a volume form on that quotient torus, uh, and the volume of that is the regulator. So regulator equals co-volume of the integral cohomology in um, the uh, real cohomology. 
And now I realize having written this, it'd been good if I told you what the regulator was for that example I had, but I don't know what it is. OK, so um, I'm erasing the definition of torsion, which is good. I always think about it this way. So how does this relate to um, what we had last time? So there's a conjecture um, related to the ones I, I stated last time, which if we have some <laughs> MN hyperbolic manifolds, some exhaustive tower of covers of some hyperbolic manifold M3, then in analog to what happens for Betty numbers, one should expect that the limit of these torsions, which is divide by the volume, should be equal to the L2 analog of this for their universal cover, which works out to be 1 on 6 pi. Um, and so, uh, that's a conjecture. Um, and now, if we take this thing and we add that the regulator term is, right, so if we take, we're looking at this and dividing by the volume. So one term of that is the quantity we were looking at last time, the exponential growth rate of the torsion in the first homology. This term is asymptotically negligible, log of volume divided by volume. Um, and so if this term isn't very big, this limit here is really just the limit I was talking about last time. It's this divided by, by the volume. So add that the regulator is small, get uh, the conjecture from last time. Um, and so I didn't put any hypotheses really here on M, arithmetic versus non-arithmetic. And I think probably people believe there shouldn't be any. So this should be a statement totally general about towers of covers of hyperbolic manifolds. And then the difference that you had in behavior between the arithmetic and non-arithmetic in the examples I showed you has to do with whether the regulator plays any significant role. So in this paper of Bergeron, Sengun, and Venkatesh, they give some reasons and prove some theorems um, that for arithmetic manifolds, you can uh, sometimes, you should expect and it sometimes can show that the regulator term is small. Um, and uh, the data that I showed suggests that's probably not true for non-arithmetic things, although I can't prove this. And so once you become interested in the regulator, you would like to relate it back to something more purely topological. Uh, just as, after all, like this term here is like some purely topological thing. Right? And the volume of M, I mean, this term doesn't even relate, so who cares? Um, and so that's the motivation for uh, looking at, at this uh, relationship. So what this tells you is that if you want to think about The question of whether the regulator is small, if you don't want to take the analytic point of view of thinking about harmonic forms and, and things like this, you can instead think about the Thurston norm. And there are these factors, but in the context, context of the asymptotics we're talking about here, they wash out. They don't, they don't really get in your way. Right, so that's my, that's my motivation. Are there questions? Not that I'm aware of. OK, so um, in the last 15 minutes, what I'd like to do is just tell you a little bit about the proof of uh, this inequality. Um, this is the one that <laughs> our proof differ, uh 
is quite different than the arguments in uh, Bergeron, Sengun, and Venkatesh. Um, whereas this inequality, we, we follow the same basic approach. It's just we took the key technical lemma and whacked on it with a hammer for a long time. So the, the argument here really is not, not very hard once you set it up correctly. Uh, the, the moral of it is that the, the harmonic norm is, uh, of course, an L2 norm. And the Thurston norm, while well, it's measuring the topological complexity, which is kind of like measuring an area. Um, and that means it's an L1 kind of thing. Uh, and you have a tool to relate L1 norms and L2 norms. That's the cauchy schwartz inequality. So the way the proof goes is you introduce bonus norms. Um, and using these bonus norms, uh, we'll sort of mediate between the Thurston norm and the L2 norm. And I'll turn this statement here just into the cauchy schwartz inequality. So what are these bonus norms? So let's start off with a, uh, just an integral cohomology class. Um, and the first one is what I'll call the least area norm. So it's going to be the same as the Thurston norm, but instead of taking the topological complexity of the surface um, minus its Euler characteristic, I'm just going to take the area of the surface. So this is going to be infimum over the area of S. Let's say S is a smooth surface, a dual to our cohomology class. Okay. So just take all surfaces uh, and take the infimum of their area. So by basic results in Geometric measure theory, um, actually, this infimum is realized. Um, so, geometric measure theory says there is actually going to be a smooth surface embedded in your three manifold um, whose area actually achieves this minimum. Um, then, and it represents this, this homology. So, it's going to be like a nice. Uh, Minimal surface, mean curvature zero, kind of concrete thing. Um, and uh, all right, so that's, that's one norm. Um, and the other norm, maybe I'll see, see if I can squeeze it in here. Maybe that's a bad idea. Um, the other norm is just the uh, L1 analog of the L2 norm I've been talking about. So right, the L2 norm was just the L2 norm of its, the smallest L2 norm of any representative. So I could do that for any LP if I so desired. So this is the infimum over the L1 norm of alpha, by which I mean the integral over m of its pointwise norm. So right, we just take, instead of taking the L2 norm here, we take the L1. Um, and this, this actually is a sort of genuine infimum. Um, and if you're willing to like work with sort of distributional forms or something, you can make it achieve. But, uh, Um, so these are, are extra special bonus norms. And there's two, two facts I need to tell you about. Uh, and then I can just prove the theorem, or this part of the theorem. The first is that, maybe I'll write it here. Uh, the first is that this actually is very close to the Thurston norm. Um, so for a hyperbolic three-manifold, 
Um, oh, shoot, I'm going to run out of room. Sorry, bad board work. Uh, so, in fact, the uh, least area norm is bounded above by 2 pi times the Thurston norm, and it's bounded below by pi times the Thurston norm. So, up maybe to a factor of 2, uh, it, it is just the Thurston norm. Okay. That's level 1. I'll explain more about it in a minute. Let me first say lemma two. Uh, lemma two is actually, I'm not giving you two bonus norms, just one. So in fact, the least area norm is uh, the L1 norm. So I'll come back in a second and motivate those lemmas, but let me, before doing so, convince you that they meet my sales pitch of turning this thing into the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. So let's say I have some now by continuity I might as well just check the inequality for uh, integral classes. Uh, and let's just look at its harmonic representative. So I want to estimate the Thurston norm in terms of the L2 norm. Well, uh, if you allow me to multiply this by pi, I can bound this above by the least area norm, which I asserted is the same as the uh, L1 norm. Now, the L1 norm is just the infimum of the L1 norm of any representative. So I'm going to take the harmonic representative. Now, I mean, this is not going to actually be ever an equality. I mean, it's not for any form, much less this one, which was chosen to minimize some other, uh, some other notion. Um, but certainly, it's, uh, we could do that. And then the point is, well, What's the L1 norm? It's just the integral of the pointwise norm function of this form, uh, which I could rewrite as the pointwise norm function times 1. 1 doesn't do much. Um, and so now what we have is we have two functions on my manifold. Uh, we're integrating the product um, over them, over the manifold. Right, that is the inner product on functions uh, on this manifold. Um, and so you can bound, Cauchy-Schwartz says you can bound an inner product above by the norms, the L2 norms, the things that come from the inner product of the two pieces. So Cauchy-Schwartz says that this is bounded above by the L2 norm of this times the L2 norm of the function 1. Um, uh, which is equal to, I mean, this is just what we defined as the harmonic norm of phi. It's the norm of its harmonic representative. Uh, and lunch is approaching. My brain is shutting down, but I think I can do this. If I integrate 1 over the manifold, I get the volume, and then I take the square root. Um, and so then if I divide this over to this side, I get exactly, exactly this. So um, in this perspective, uh, it's just this. Um, and maybe I should say just a couple words about the lemmas. Um, in both of these follow. Uh, This is certainly not original to us. Uh, this has been known for a long time, although maybe not quite in this language. Well, I think basically in this language. Um, the, 
This really is a, a statement that comes out of facts about minimal surfaces. So, as I said earlier, um, with the uh, least area norm, you can actually find a surface which achieves it. So it's going to be this nice minimal surface in your hyperbolic three manifold. And if you have a minimal surface, something of mean curvature zero, intrinsically its curvature is always bounded above by the curvature of the ambient manifold. Right? So you have this surface sitting in your manifold and its curvature at every point is bounded above by minus one. So if you think about what gauss bonnet tells you, it's telling you exactly this inequality. Right? You would get a quality here if your surface was totally geodesic. Right? Curvature exactly minus one everywhere. This inequality is more subtle um, because you can certainly have minimal surfaces which are much, much more negatively curved than the ambient space. And that would mean this constant would be really small. Uh, but that can't happen in this case because it turns out our minimal surface is something called stable. Um, if you push it in either direction, it, the, the area actually goes up. Right? Minimal surface means critical point of area function. This is an honest minimum of area function. Um, so in that case, results of Shane say that there's an a priori lower bound on the curvature. Um, and uh, it doesn't seem that anybody's actually worked out what that bound is. But for the area, there's a nice result of Uhlenbeck, uh, which gives exactly this. So I should attribute this to uh, Shane Uhlenbeck. Um, and this, I don't have time to talk about this, but it really is kind of an easy observation in geometric measure theory coming from something called the co-area formula. And so then with those pieces, you, uh, you get this. Um, and maybe I should say, sort of to extol the virtues of giving talks on work that's not done, um, originally, we had a much more complicated proof of this, uh, which didn't have effective constants. Uh, and it was very combinatorial. It used like simplicial complexes. And eventually, you reduced it to the Cauchy-Schwartz, but it was on some finite dimensional thing. Um, and at my talk, someone asked, you know, uh, well, this is all very nice, Nathan, but does it really have to be this complicated? Uh, you know, can you think about this sort of in the smooth category? Uh, and the answer is yes. Uh, and now we have this very simple, uh, very simple. OK, that's, that's what I wanted to say. So let me stop there. Okay, any questions? Yeah. This half of the inequality would be done quite a nice. Yes. Depth, but how about the other half? Oh, yes. It's a, it's a similar kind of, um, of argument. Uh, I mean, um, what, what, it, what it involves is uh, using Poincaré duality, um, you can, to estimate the L2 norm of something, it involves integrating the harmonic representative over the surface that's Poincaré dual to the class. And so then you take the least area surface in that class, so now it's a surface of bounded area, and then you're integrating an L2, this, this L2 form over it, harmonic form. And so what you need is, um, here we were somehow relating L1 and L2. What you need is a relation between, what you need is sort of a pointwise bound on the harmonic form in terms of its L2 norm. Because if you have that, then you're integrating over the surface of bounded area. You get some kind of concrete information. Um, and so what you need is, yeah, a bound on the L infinity norm for harmonic form in terms of, um, it's L2 norm. And that's something that Bergeron, Sengun, and Venkatesh got just by sort of appealing to the of inequalities. Um, we get this by a more painful method um, that gives an explicit, a very explicit concept by looking at a Fourier type expansion of harmonic, harmonic uh, one forms in H3. Um, and it turns out only the first term really contributes. And so it, it boils down to some concrete calculation.